Good afternoon. Welcome to Global Report. I'm your host, Loi, hosting all the way live from Singapore. We have with us today Dr. Adam Garfinkel. He is the former speechwriter to Secretaries Condoleezza Rice and Colin Powell. Dr. Garfinkel is also the founding editor of the American Interest. Welcome back to the show, Dr. Garfinkel. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I'd like to say something I've always been wanting to say for years. Hello, Hawaii. How are you? <laughs> uh, Lulu, Lulu. Can you do it again with Aloha? Aloha. Hello, Hawaii. It's an old song, you know, from 1913 or 1915. Uh, One of my favorite songs. I think people in Hawaii know the song. Yeah. Well, thank you so much. Uh, before we start, I do want to share with you that, you know, quite a few viewers wrote in after the last show to thank you for your very insightful in input. Um, so thank you very much. Now, today I'd like to get your take on U.S.-China. Um, except it's such a big can of worms. I don't know where to start. Maybe we can start from the present. What do you think of U.S.'s approach towards, <clears throat> excuse me, towards China nowadays? That's a big question. People have written many books about this only in the past year or two. Um, I don't, I don't <clears throat> answer that question without, without launching into some kind of a lecture, which we don't want to do. Let me just start with uh, what I consider to be the, the bottom line as of June 3rd, 2020. Uh, things are bad, really bad. Uh, I would go so far as to say that they're dangerous, uh, more dangerous than I have ever uh, in my lifetime can remember. Um, and they're dangerous because uh, there is no um, bright line between domestic and foreign policy when you get down to how things really work. Uh, we have two leaderships, very different kinds of leaderships, but two leaderships in, in Washington and Beijing that uh, tend to subsume many foreign policy judgments under um, political rubrics. Uh, President Trump cares pretty much only about his own political circumstances, especially so in an election year. And all of his judgments with respect to China this year and before are really signals uh, that are designed to affect his domestic political standing and to uh, arouse his domestic political base. So what looked like foreign policy decisions, and this isn't just China, this goes with respect to the entire you know, withdrawal from the world and things like that. But these are really domestic political signals and their actual effect on the world and on American foreign policy and national security policy are secondary in this man's mind to how they play out in terms of politics. Now, every American president going back throughout the entire 20th century and before uh, thinks, thinks about politics when they think about these kinds of foreign policy and national security decisions. But Donald Trump is, is unique in this regard because he is unlettered. He doesn't understand these issues and doesn't care to. His, his previous life did not prepare him for any of these kinds of, of challenges and subjects. So whereas it's a, it's a matter of the proportion, he cares only about the politics. Right? He doesn't understand the rest. And he's surrounded now by C-team types who don't understand very well either. That wasn't the case at the beginning of the administration when General Mattis was around and General and McMaster was around, but now it's certainly the case. Now in China, uh, it's different, but it's similar. Uh, Xi Jinping has a lot of political pressure weighing down on him, some of it his own making, some of it the consequence of the fact that it is an, an authoritarian, neo-totalitarian system. Uh, there are wolf warriors, uh, hyper-nationalists now rising in China, possibly within the PLA as well. So he has his political concerns. Um, so both of these leaderships right now are feeling a lot of pressure. Uh, Xi Jinping isn't running for re-election, of course, but he still feels political pressure and political opposition. Uh, we, we can't see what's inside the Politburo. It's a black box compared to- uh, Dr. Garfinkel, um, so, so who are the actual ones that make decisions on foreign policy? Is it well, the, the State Department? Is it the, the Defense Minister? Is it the sea the level you know, executive, like you said? Let me, let me, let me put it to you this. It's a, it's a big government, and there are lots of uh, uh, policy relationships that have been ongoing for years and years and years. So when somebody in the White House or somebody up high in the administration doesn't mess with uh, these ongoing relationships, then they're handled normally by the various uh, uh, executive agencies, executive departments that typically handle them. You mentioned the State Department, that's certainly one, the Defense Department, Justice Department, the Treasury Department's very important when it comes to international economic relations, the Office of the Trade Representative and so forth. So as long as nobody messes, uh, uh, inserts themselves into these relationships, they run normally, okay? Uh, they lose energy after a while from a lack of 
direction and leadership, but they, they still function. But there's a difference between making foreign policy and foreign relations, which is carrying out sort of ordinary, everyday, quotidian relationships. When it comes to initiatives or reacting to crisis, then you need high leadership. And in this case, in the United States, we don't have the kind of high leadership that is capable of actual strategic thinking or even, even of creating policies in the normal sense of the term. I think I mentioned this before, possibly on the show, but uh, these people don't have ideas. They have, as Lionel, Lionel Trilling once said back in 1950, they have irritable mental gestures masquerading as ideas. They don't actually have real ideas. So nobody is making policy in that sense. Right now in the administration, uh, over the past, I would say, two to three years, the man who has emerged as uh, more important than others in, in, the, uh, in the scheme has been Mike Pompeo who is the, the, the current Secretary of State. And the reason that Pompeo has developed this primus inter pares kind of status is because he is doggedly loyal to the president. And that's what counts in this, in this White House. Uh, if you're loyal to the president, all right, then you have power uh, that, 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 that emanates out from the president himself. If, if you don't have this personal sense of, uh, of uh, approval, right, if there's some disagreement or some, some uncertainty about the loyalty of the individual, then that person doesn't have any power. So we saw what you can't disagree with this president. See what happened to General Mattis, what happened to John Bolton, my friend John Bolton. Uh, all these people, if you disagree with him or if you give him trouble, he fires you or he forces you out. So all that's left are loyal yes men. And Pompeo was the most loyal yes man around. And so he has accrued more power than, than all of his colleagues. Now, final, final thing about this. Typically, in a typical administration, in a normal administration, you have National Security Council meetings from time to time on, impo on important subjects. These are called principles committee meetings. So the Secretary of State, Secretary of Defense will get, and the Secretary of the Treasury sometimes, depends on you know, uh, the Chairman of the Joint Chiefs, uh, sometimes the head of the, uh, the NDI will show up in a room with the President or with the Vice President, they'll talk about some important issue. In this administration, there are no anymore, there aren't any more NSC meetings. The, the principles do not get together and discuss things. That hasn't happened since April a year ago. That's extremely unusual. So right now, all you have is the president, this guy, Robert O'Brien, who was the State Department negotiator, not on the level of any national security advisor we've seen in recent decades, and, and Pompeo, and a couple of you know, private friends that the president will turn to from time to time. It's very informal. It's not regularized. It isn't systematic. It's not written down. Lord help future historians who want to who consult the archives, because there won't be any <laughs> in a typical no, sense. No, it's very, very that. weird. Yeah. Now, Dr. Garfinger, in the, in the earlier interview, you said that instead of working with the allies, the United States is actually pissing off all the allies. What do you think they should yeah. be work, uh, doing with the allies in order to do better with China? What should they be doing? Well, again, you know, let's just, let's just refer to the word diplomacy. Uh, the word di diplomacy is, is, in a sense, a very simple thing. It only involves two functions. There are only two things that, that diplomats do. Diplomacy involves negotiation and it involves consultation. That's it. Those are the two only things that diplomacy consists of. Most of it consists of consultation. And most of the people you consult with are your allies, your friends, partners. It could be formal allies or not, not formal allies. Uh, and that's just to keep everybody on the same page and make sure that everyone's interests um, are, continue to overlap sufficiently to do business with one another. Uh, we don't do that uh, in, the, in this administration. The United States doesn't do that. We don't do normal consultations at high levels. Again, the quotidian stuff, you know, for example, our FSOs here in the embassy in Singapore, where we are, I mean, they talk to people in the government here in Singapore, but that's just normal everyday kind of stuff. They don't have authority to initiate new ideas, new proposals, uh, new understandings. They just sort of, you know, they just sort of, you know, keep the egg timer running, so to speak, right? But we don't consult with our allies. We don't consult with anybody. Uh, all we do is get in, the president gets angry, makes nasty noises, and he, and he imposes tariffs on people. That's pretty much the the sum total of the diplomacy. Now, what you should do, of course, with the point of, a, of, a, of, a, of an alliance, the, the, the point of a relationship with a friend or a partner is to concert your, your, uh, your efforts and direct them toward others in a way that is propitious for your interests. We don't do that, as I mentioned before. I mean, if you wanna, it, look, it was necessary to adjust the trade relationship between the United States and China. It should have been done a long time ago, right? Uh, any administration following the Obama administration would have done something because things were getting out of hand. Um, and there was a consensus, Democratic and Republican, that something had to be done. But the way you do it is you, you, you get together with your friends first and you decide on a joint strategy for going at the problem. You don't, you don't, you don't 
you know, screw all your allies first and then, and then try to face the Chinese by yourself. That's just stupid. That's the technical term for it. Stupid. So that's what these people do. Because as I said, they don't have policies. They don't think. They don't plan. They have no policy imagination. They're just irritable mental gestures masquerading as ideas or masquerading, in this case, as policy. That's what they do. Now, Dr. Garfinger, I, I think the U.S. does at least make some effort. You know, um, for example, in the case of the Huawei's technology, it does try to get you know its allies to revive Huawei's technology. I don't the five G technology. I don't think they're very successful. Well, it's it's not successful. So, well, there, that's a very five G thing is very complicated. Like a lot of this stuff is, has technical aspects and is very complicated. But it's it's not been successful. It's not clear that it would have been successful with a more astute uh, and normal consultative administration. But it's, you, it's, relationships with allies, as well as with adversaries, are in a sense seamless. Uh, everything connects to everything else. Th there's a mood in the relationship. That's part of what the personal relationships do. They, they create this sort of seamless sense of trust. It's really about trust. So if you, if you, let's take the European allies, America's European allies. If you, if, you, if you tell them right off the bat that you, know, you don't really care about Article 5, which is the essence of the NATO treaty, right? mutual self-defense, you know, self uh, and you, you, know, you, you give them all a laundry problem, wondering if they're really still under the American nuclear umbrella and things like that. If you shake their cage that, well, that way and, you, and you, 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 you give them reason not to trust you, and then three weeks later, you come to them and say, we want you to, uh, to join us on, on new maximum pressure uh, sanctions against Iran. The fact that you have dissed them three weeks earlier is going to affect the way they, they approach that. Same thing with uh, you know, leaving the Paris Climate Accord in Asia, uh, leaving the TTP, the, the Trans-Pacific Trade Arrangement. If you do that kind of thing, and then you go back a couple of weeks later and say, I want you to, hey, let's get together on this. They're going to say, wait a minute, and I trust these people, right? So it, it's a, these relationships are seamless. They're seamless bilaterally. And to some extent, the multilateral, you know, clot of the relationships is also a seamless thing. The mood matters, right? Uh, it, you know, the, the policy, the, the conversations we have with, uh, with our allies are the lyrics, but you don't have lyrics without the music, and the music is the mood. So this, this, this administration is very bad musically. It's tone deaf. Put it that way. So, so do you think this, uh, um, the current strategy, if there's a strategy, is trying to contain China? Are they trying to isolate China? You know, these people use a lot of language very lazily these days. Um, for example, right now, if you look at the American, you know, periodical literature on this subject, uh, the phrase new Cold War is ubiquitous. It pops up all over the place. Are, are we about to enter into a new Cold War with China? But with all due respect to my colleagues who use this language, this is very misleading and foolish language. Uh, unless you dumb down the phrase, the term Cold War, really dumb it down. Just to mean any any rivalry with another great power that's that's short of bloodletting, then any great power relationship in history can be called a cold war. All right, but if you actually look at what the the cold war was, that is to say, the U.S. Soviet uh, competition between roughly 1947-48 and um, and and November November 9th, uh, 1989, uh, it had three elements that do not apply to the relationship between the United States and China, and never will. Very briefly, the three elements were. The, the Cold War was a highly ideological kind of thing. Both sides believed that the future of the planet in moral cosmological terms depended on the outcome. There is no ideological dimension in the US-China relationship of that kind. There's a difference between a preference for democratic versus authoritarian forms of, of government, and this is a cultural deep uh, difference, but it's not an ideology in the conventional sense. Second difference was that the Cold War wasn't fought between two countries, it was fought between blocks. Right? You mentioned alliances. It was fought between two blocks, the Western Bloc and the Warsaw Pact or the Soviet Bloc. China doesn't have a block. Is Cambodia a block? I mean, this is silly. And, and, and the fact that it was con conducted by blocks uh, and, th and that it forced choices on third parties, you know, on neutral countries, as to whether they wanted to join or not join one block or the other, that gave the Cold War uh, essentially a global fluidity that you could call it actually a global system because every country was implicated in it one way or another. And it was possible to have peripheral strategies. It was possible to fight proxy wars without inviting a central strategic or a hegemonic war. All those things were characteristic of the bloc nature of the Cold War. There's no such, there's no such thing uh, with the US and China. Uh, the, the American relationships with its allies in Asia are much looser, uh, hub and spoke-like. They're not multilateral like NATO. 
And as I say, China has no block. Uh, so it, 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 the, it the, the phrase Cold War just makes no sense. So and it would be correct to say that's, that's still, so it will be correct to say that you don't think there's any ideological competition between the two, is that right? Not really. Not, not, not if you use the word ideology in a, in a strict fashion. Again, there are differences in culture that, that exude into politics and the way people, leaderships think about politics, and they're serious. In fact, I can't think of any, any two, two peoples in the world that are liable to misunderstand each other more than Americans and Chinese. Uh, but that's not ideology. That's just, that's just not understanding the other, way, the other, the way the other side thinks. And that's a so very to, to, take that, to take that a step further, you do not think that Chinese is trying to impose the autocracy across the world? No, I don't. I think, I think uh, what, what the Chinese government is interested in doing, uh, as best I, I'm not an expert on China, but I, you know, I read and I talk to people. Uh, China is still getting over its 100 years, or it's really more than that, 150 years of humiliation. And uh, what, China, what China would like to see- I know who you've been talking to. <laughs> I talked to, talk to Wang Gungwu and he's the best. And I talked to lots of people. Uh, obviously, the, you know, the, during the Xi Jinping era, uh, the Chinese have come, become much more assertive and much more nationalist, but that's because the, uh, uh, the, the only credential the Communist Party has in China is for the economy to keep growing leaps and bounds. And of course it isn't going to do that because of the middle income trap, because of the, talk about a trap, how about demography, the one child policy, basically dooms the Chinese economy to a plateau pretty soon and other, other issues. So they can't, it's not gonna grow economically. It's not gonna you know, keep being that dynamic economically. So all, the, all that the party has, has left to fall back on is Chinese on nationalism, right? And that's a problem. So I'm not saying, I'm not saying it's a nice government. I'm also, also in, in, the, in the Xi Jinping era, it's no longer kind of market authoritarianism. It's a neo-totalitarian state. It's trying to do things that the Soviets were trying to do, say, in the 20s and 30s. You see the yeah, social... I, the, I, think, I think the Chinese... I, I don't, it's I, not I a agree nice government, you. don't get me wrong. But, but I really think that, that China's concerns are mostly defensive. And, and they're trying to re, sort of recreate their tributary system from 1,200 years ago or 1,400 years ago. I don't think China is a military threat to the United States. And I don't think, I don't even think China is a threat to, um, uh, to U.S. allies in Asia anymore than the United States has been a hegemon to, it, to its neighbors in the New World for the past 150 years. I mean, the, the, the China wants a kind of a, a, a sort of semi-exclusive sphere, and it doesn't want other great powers, you know, right on its literal, right on its coast. How would the United States feel? If the Chinese had something like the Seventh Fleet, all right, something equivalent to the Seventh Fleet, and it was sailing along outside the outside the coast of San Diego or Honolulu, okay, all the time, how would we feel if the Chinese were doing that to us? You know, uh, Robert Burns, uh, a great great poet, uh, one of the most famous lines he ever wrote in poetry. I love to quote this: "Oh, would God the gift to give us to see ourselves as others see us." Right? It's a beautiful, brilliant, profound remark in poetry. Sometimes I wish that people in the United States could try to see the world in, in Asia the way that the Chinese see it, right? Uh, well, I, I certainly hope that when you go home, you can share some of this with, uh, you know, with your circle at home. I, I, I agree with you. I don't think Chinese trying to impose the autocracy across the world, but I do think they're trying to create some kind of safe space for autocracy yeah. so that they can cement the Communist Party rule at home see, because they want to look, keep that secure. Let me, let me put it this way. Everybody knows that there's such a thing called American exceptionalism. But there's also a form of Chinese exceptionalism, Han Chinese exceptionalism, but they're inverted. American exceptionalism says the following. We are the best. We know best universal practice. This comes from our enlightenment liberalism. But we're very nice about it. We are the best. We're special, but everybody can be like us. Everybody can be like us. And American policy sometimes verges into a global, a global version of the Monroe Doctrine. Right? Not only can you be like us, you should be like us because the world will be safer. This is democratic peace theory. The world will be safer if you're like us, right? if you're democratic, capitalist, open market minded. Chinese have a very similar but inverted view. Chinese view is we're special, no, but we're special. Nobody can be like us and we don't want anybody to try to be like us. So they're, they're two ex exceptionalisms, but they're inverted, you see? And I think if you understand that, you get a real feel for the underlying currents of the misunderstanding. In the relationship, Chinese look at the United States. What's the what's the what's the origin of the relationship with the United States? Was traders and missionaries, and the and the remember the Taiping Rebellion in Chinese history. The Chinese still think of the United States as a missionary country, as a country trying to spread its thinking and its ways to other countries, including to China. Uh, 
but the Chinese don't think of themselves as a missionary country outward toward others because their exceptionalism is exclusionary, not inclusionary. Nobody can be like us. That's, that's their view. You see the difference? Huh. Yes, yes. Dr. Garfinkel, is it possible to have a two edges on? Because you mentioned uh, American universalism. I remember something that L.K. Wiley Kuan Yu once said is that, you know, the American people think that their ideas are universal. They believe in the supremacy of the individual, the right to free, unfettered speech. But those values are not in, in, in universal. They never will. And maybe every nation should have its right to its own social, cultural, political institution and value system. And maybe no country, even in the name of universal values, in the name of good intentions, um, should be imposing that kind of well, you're, values you're, on other sovereign nations. Well, you're speaking to the converted when you talk to me. I mean, I, I certainly agree with that. As long as a, a country doesn't try to impose its, its views on others, live and let live, I think is a very good but here's the, here's the interesting thing, though. We are living, in, we have been living in a world for the past, at least the past 25 years, that's increasingly more integrated. So we have uh, with capital flows and labor, mi migratory and other forms of labor flows and cultural ideas flow. Everything flows. That's the nature of globalization. So globalization, in order to work and not be a corrosive to international political and, and uh, security relationships, has to find a way to segregate out these cultural and ide ideological factors, right? Uh, because integration and live and let live are contradictory in some respects. It takes a delicate, careful um, way of thinking to keep these things separate. Otherwise, the closer you get in terms of economics and cultural exchange, uh, the more friction you get in terms of you know, moral values and, and ideology. So this is one of the problems. I mean, there would be no need to contain China, would there? Not, the, not that that's, I, I think, a good idea. It's, a, it's wrong language. There would be no need to contain China. And look, when we were containing the Soviet Union during the Cold War, we had a mutual autarkic economic relationship. We and the Soviets didn't trade very much. That is wildly untrue of the U.S.-China relationship, right? That's why people are talking about hard decoupling, partial decoupling, just, you know, readjustments. Because we are integrated economically to a considerable degree. That's another reason why the Cold War metaphor is completely lulu when it comes to this kind of thing. It doesn't apply at all because of the economic relationship. But if you want to have a tight economic relationship worldwide, if you want, to, if you want an integrated global economy for good and for ill purposes sometimes, then it's going to be harder to, to develop and maintain a live and let live attitude toward these higher value kinds of subjects. That's just the way the world is. I hope this doesn't come across as bad news to people, but, you know, wake up and smell the tea. Yeah. That's how it is. Well, the, the, the fact is, though, that American is uh, involved in a lot of conflicts around the world, it seems. I mean, in our previous interview, we talked about America's troubles in the Middle East with Russia. That's the ceaseless wars in the Middle East. That's the escalation escalation of tension and arms race with Russia. And now there's a spat with China over trade over coronavirus. Uh, my question is, why is the United States enga engaged in so many different conflicts? Part of it, well, first of all, the United States is not necessarily just engaged in conflicts. We're also engaged in all sorts of, you know, cooperative relationships. A lot of this is legacy from the Cold War. The United States extended itself after the Second World War into every nook and cranny of the international system because we had near hegemonic power, at least in the first 10 or 15 years. And uh, American policy became global. And once you get the habit of that, you build up bureaucracies that do that. You can't suddenly flip a switch and say, okay, finish. I'm not going to do that anymore. So a lot of these relationships um, have developmental heft behind them, and we continue to um, uh, exhibit a, a metabolism in our international relationships that um, uh, really harks back to a, an era that's already 25, 30 years gone. Now, you would argue, could argue that the world, since the world is more integrated and everything is more connected than it was before, and since all these stakes um, are seamless with one another, that the same kind of very high metabolism is necessary. You could also argue, thirdly, that, you know, uh, any international system, any any international order, however frail it may be or incomplete it may be, needs leadership, needs guidance. And so a lot of you, you'll hear a lot the argument that if the United States does not sit at the table ma to make the rules for how the world order will, will evolve, then somebody else will. And what we want is an open uh, uh, democratic system, transparent system, but most other great powers don't want that. The Russians certainly don't want that. The Chinese don't want that. So if we don't sit at the table, we don't involve ourselves, in uh, a lot of these discussions, for example, the future of the internet, not all these things are, are military strategic in, in character at all. If we don't sit at the table and, and put in our two cents, then others whose values are inimical to ours will make the rules. 
that's that's one of the arguments why it was it was so stupid to leave the uh, Trans-Pacific Trade Arrangements, right? Because the whole point of that was to create a a system, you know, a Trans-Pacific system that would benefit everybody economically, that could be regulated, but that would reflect an open, transparent order, right? And that cared about environmental standards, cared about labor standards. If the United States leaves the table, then who's left to care about that? If the Chinese make the rules, the rules will end up looking much different. Uh, and, it won't, and it won't be good for the little guy. Remember, in international relations, typically, in history, typically, uh, there are only two kinds of actors. There are the diners and there are the entrees. And the small countries tend to become the entrees in balance with our macht politique systems. So what the United States and its, its allies have been trying to do, more or less successfully, since the Second World War, was create a world that's safe for small powers, where small powers can also get around the table and don't have to be the entree. They can also be one of the diners. In a, in a pure great power mock politics system, the small powers are in trouble, like they've always been. So uh, it's, I mean, it, it, I think it's, it's, it's a mischaracterization to say that American uh, international activity is solely based around conflict zones. That's just not accurate. Yeah, but I'm just wondering uh, who's benefit from all, all of this. I mean, there are conflicts. Who's benefiting benefiting from all of this? Because there seems to be this uh, massive military industrial complex in the United States. Does this have anything to do with you know the arms manufacturers, the lobbying groups? It really doesn't. This is a this is an old you know kind of Marxist idea that uh, you know economic interests, uh, uh, private uh, corporate economic interest, interests determine everything about the way that American foreign policy. Is and that's just nonsense. Um, if you had money uh, 15, 20, 20 years ago, eight years ago, the last place you'd want to invest money would be in a, in a defense contractor. I mean, uh, defense contractors are monopsonies. They don't um, have uh, a lot of customers. They have just governments as customers. I mean, and governments don't, don't want them or don't need them. They don't do well. So this, this, this whole military industrial complex stuff is a, is a kind of a Marxist red herring that has no, very little of any basis in reality. I mean, you, there are even even stranger arguments about this, that, you know, for example, the Iraq war was fought because the United States wanted Iraqi oil. I mean, this is just, you have to be almost terminally ignorant to think a thing like that. Uh, the, the international oil market is, is, a, is a vertically integrated market. It's an international market. It's denominated in dollars, but nobody controls it. Uh, it, it again, you just have to not understand what's going on in the world to think conspiratorial stuff like that. It's just not true. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Garfinkel. Um, I wish we have more time. I know half an hour doesn't do justice to your true ability to elucidate the entire picture of everything for us. Um, but I truly appreciate the generosity of your time and the sharing of your institutional knowledge. I think very few of us have memory of it anymore. So thank you so much, sir. Thank you very much. My pleasure.